The contrast between myself and Dennis couldn't be much more stark. Uh, having come from the UK a lot more recently than your boat people, <laughs> but still nonetheless from the UK, I'm a coral reef ecologist who ended up in Bondi and kind of got stuck here. Um, when, I got, when I came in 96 and ran the International Year of the Reef for the IUCN, which is part of what uh, this is all about, the World Parks Congress. And <clears throat> I wasn't going to dive here at all. I was the marine biologist at the Cousteau Resort in Fiji. And I came to Sydney and I came for a dive show, actually. It was uh, Sue Crow tricky. She said, you've got to get in the water and have a look at the underwater world of Bondi and Sydney. And she took me to Oak Park and I went, you kidding? I've spent the last 10 years in the Pacific Southeast Asia diving, teaching diving, working underwater. I'm not diving in Sydney. It's cold. And she said, I'll lend you a wetsuit. And I was like, oh, God, OK. And she took me. She took me to Oak Park. I saw more species of nudibranch, the little sea slugs, in that dive at Oak Park than I had in the six months in Fiji prior. And I was hooked. I was like, blimey, that's just really quite remarkable. And uh, being young at the time and free and single at the time, which I'm no longer, I ended up gravitating to Bondi, as you can see from the balcony that most uh, young people do. And I thought, this building's pretty cool, the pavilion. We need to do stuff here. And uh, that's how this idea was born, of actually trying to bring the underwater wonders of, of Sydney. We did a post. We had these little signs. It was back in the days when Judy was helping us to to get going on, on the south side, saying, do some photos of what it looks like at Clavelli Pool. And Clavelli Pool, we took some photos, we put them outside, old boards at the front of this pavilion. And people were going, wow, is that the Barrier Reef? And we went, no, 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 it's just there. Just there. And then we did a postcode survey. We thought, oh, these bloody tourists, oh, they don't know anything. Did a postcode survey. There were Sydney sliders. They had no idea that this lot was living right on their doorstep. And we thought it was time to do something about it. So that's what I'm going to do today, hopefully, is just give you a little bit of idea of underwater Bondi. And I'm just going to show a short film now that starts at the beach in the shallows, goes through the shallows, goes up here onto the rock pools, down to the... Oh, I've got rid of the lights, that's great. Down to this boulder zone and out to the deep. And with any luck, it'll work. <laughs> We've just gone through the surf zone and now we're into the shallows. It's a shame it's a bit light, but we've got all the calerpid sea, sea, um, seaweeds. It's actually not seagrass, it's seaweeds. And it's really beautiful under there. It's surprising. And it's right next to these houses. Right next to the houses there. We've got the gropers, we've got all sorts of creatures. Absolutely beautiful. It really is quite remarkable. And this was just where we did the walk yesterday, in okay. fact. We've got these strange creatures as well, these bipedal creatures. They're pretty awful in the water. And the quadrupeds as well. Sea dogs. And then these are the scary creatures at Bondi. There's millions of them on the beach at the moment, the nippers, the kids, looking at the marine life. And this is how I started with all this. It's a dangerous thing to do. Looking at the sea stars, all sorts of creatures. Little nitty ranks, lots and lots and lots of stuff. This is one of my favourite creatures, the Waratah anemone. There we go, especially for New South Wales, perfect. You really can't see this film terribly well, but there's beautiful urchins, bubble anemones, all sorts of stuff that's out there. Really, really, really special. And this is all within Kui of up to 50,000 people on this beach on a hot summer's day. It really, really, really is quite amazing that, like yesterday we did the walk with Gary, and I showed them about 20 species that were 
people have no idea about within 10 meters of all of these people who are blissfully unaware. Okay, so this is really what it's like under bon underwater at Bondi. It is really, truly beautiful. And it's getting more beautiful by the minute since we've actually got rid of the light. So this is a Pycnogonid, a sea spider, would you believe? Sea hares, more children. These things are scary. They really are. And our friends over in the boulder fields. This is just off the boat ramp. We've got the old wives, got lots of gropers, got lots of other kinds of fish. It really is very, very, very diverse. 600 species of fish, more or less, in Sydney Harbour. Mediterranean only has 400. So we're talking about something that's really quite unique. If you get a chance, get in there. It's 21 degrees. <laughs> It's lovely being inside, but it's much nicer being in the ocean, it has to be said. We managed to get the blue groper as the state fish of New South Wales in 1998, which was a bit of a push, and that was actually one of the reasons we managed to get the aquatic reserve at Cavalli to uh, actually have some teeth and stop people spearing these things, uh, sorry not spearing them, but actually line fishing them in the pool, not allowed to line fish them in the pool anymore either, which is good. This is just off Flat Rock, so literally as you look at the sea, just that northern headland, this is exactly what's there. It's really, really beautiful. And as we get deeper, and we need to dive, then it gets even more interesting. Because this is just up the Cathedral Cave, and then we go through Slot Cave, and we find lots of little weird looking beasties. Like barnacles, like this one. I'm actually an invertebrate biologist, so I had to have invertebrates in my film. There was no way. <laughs> I could just have the mega for that. do do naughty things sometimes, don't they, Tricky? Right, no. <laughs> it's really quite spectacular down there. Um, you can see why I was hooked. I thought it was going to be, you know, shopping trolleys and mud and yuck and horrible stuff like that. I had no idea what it was going to look like this. Red Indian fish. I mean, what a bizarre thing that is. Mimicking a, mimicking a sponge. Remarkable. Three hearts and green blood. How cool are these creatures? They're very, very cool. And Port Jackson sharks, namesake of the harbour. Remarkable beasties. <laughs> God, these things are cute. Little dumpling squid. Absolutely gorgeous. And this is the females. They've come in. They've come in to breed, so she's full of eggs. And the giant cuttlefish. Biggest cuddle in the world. Really, really quite special. But there's something right on the end there, right off the Mermaid Rock, right off the end there. There's a patch of sand down at about 21 metres, 22 metres, depending on what the tide's doing. And we have these beautiful beasties. Mythical creatures. There we go. There's a better picture of one. <laughs> the sea dragons. They are truly, truly remarkable. Like something out of some sort of sci-fi movie. Bizarre. Only found in Southern Australia. And, you know, the males have the babies, but they don't have a pouch. They have the eggs here on the tail, and they look after them. It's quite a remarkable concept. Aren't they mythical? Something quite special about them. Really, really special. So that's that patch of sand off there. And that is a good day, it has to be said. Four of them floating around together. You don't get it every dive, but most dives, most dives. Thank you very much for 
having a look at that. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Good. <coughs> you can see it as well. Okay, lovely. So that's Bondi. Ooh, sorry. That's Bondi. And that's where we've just been. We've just been for that little tour around there. And I created with a few friends this Marine Discovery Centre here in the pavilion. And the whole point of it was to be an interface between this and this. And that was the idea. And it was to try and do it through education, but with an entertaining um, forefront and change the way people look, feel, and much more importantly, act towards the marine environment. Okay, there's Bondi, 1875. The house, the cottage I was born in in Cornwall was built in 1850. <coughs> so when I saw that photo and saw that it was 1875, I was like, blimey, that's a big change. <laughs> Clearly unsustainable. Completely unsustainable. This was the Marine Discovery Centre, just briefly. We built a dive site inside. It was pretty cool, but it was not financially realistic. Like the financial world has real reality, not. Okay, but we still do this, the school excursions. Lots and lots of kids, <coughs> sponsored by Snapcoal, thank goodness. And you've got your free cans of tuna over there that are caught in FAO approved areas, which is important in terms of marine regulation and lines on maps, etc. This is where we take them out to the rocks, exactly where that walk was, but we keep them wet, where that's the, um, the film was. And then we used to do lots of festivals. We used to do loads. Now we don't do any. Government cuts. We had four f environmental festivals a year at Bondi. Now we have zero. So uh, but we do still have the Summerama program, though, which is good. So we'll be doing Rockport walks in um, Bondi, down at Maroubra, and also at, um, in the harbour at Nielsen Park for the three local councils. So keep an eye on that. We even took, this was a good one, we took the local mayors, the 15 local mayors that uh, Sydney Coastal Council Group, <coughs> and we took them snorkelling. Only one of them had previously snorkelled before. These were harbour mayors. One of them had ever stuck their head underwater. They were making decisions on all this stuff. They had no idea. So I think this sort of engagement is really important. Get people in there. If they don't do it, you know, I, I got Peter King, who was, the, who was the member at the time. I put a, I, he came snorkelling, I put a horn shark in his hands picked one up, put it in his hands, and he was like, whoa. He listened. That made a big impact, big, big impact. Okay, now, <clears throat> what I thought would be useful, I used to be on the Marine Parks Advisory Council from 97 to 2007, 10 years of <sighs> breathless excitement, not. But I thought, and, and to be honest, I gave up in about 2006. It was just all too hard. It wasn't going anywhere, and I had a a baby which was the Marine Discovery Centre and I also had by that stage a real baby as well and life was getting awfully complicated. So I thought, nah, I'll stop and moved on. But this has been a really good chance to get back into where marine parks are at in New South Wales and I've done a bit of research and I've passed it on. I've handed out these sheets, shows you where the marine protected areas are in New South Wales. If you turn over, I put together this little timeline of the years of what's happened when. <laughs> because I knew that that slide wouldn't work on the, on the screen. So we started really well in 37 with Green Island and the GBR in 75, and then good old Ocean Rescue kicked in. And most importantly, this national representative system of marine protected areas was kind of outlined. Yeah, this is really important, that was. And then the Rio summit happened, and we committed internationally to all this stuff, which is great. Then Sydney went ahead and created 14 intertidal protected areas in 93, which was way, way, way early. That was great. Sadly, that was more or less the last action that happened in marine protected areas in Sydney, but we, did, we started well. We did really well. It was great. And then I was running the Year of the Reef. We went with reefs all around to try and include the temperate reefs. Then Solitary Islands Marine Park came on board. New South Wales Marine Parks Act. That's when the Marine Parks Advisory Councils were created. And the IMCRA report was put on. I'm going to flick to that now. <clears throat> this is, you can't read this either, but it doesn't really matter. The fact, the most important thing is that this has got to be representative, comprehensive and adequate. Governments have committed to this. This is important. It's mainly about preserving biodiversity, which doesn't really help in the Sydney context, it has to be said, because the, the biodiversity qualities of Sydney are not 
outstanding because we can't, comp you know, you can't compare Sydney, a city of four million people, with the solitary islands or Jarvis Bay. It's got to be compared with other major world cities. Compared to other mo major world cities, its biodiversity is out of the park. It's off the scale. It's awesome. But it's not pristine, let's face it. The most important thing is these. These are the selection criteria. There are definitely economic aspects. There are definitely social aspects. There are definitely feasible aspects, good and bad. These are where I think the opportunities lie for marine protected areas or marine parks or whatever it is in, in the Sydney area, not really in the major guts of it, the biodiversity aspect. It's good, but it's not great for, for the bioregion. This was the IMCRA. So these were the bioregions around the country that were put together. Great document. Didn't have a lot of back, background on it at the time. So that's what you're looking at. These are the different bioregions. The bioregion we're looking at is the Hawkesbury Shelf bioregion. And that's the context for Sydney. Sydney sits, Sydney sits you know, more or less in the slap bang in the middle of this thing, and it's really, really the area. But again, you've got to compare it with these other major cities. You can't compare it with Lord Howe. You can't compare it with Solitary Islands. It's just not the thing. Thanks, mate. That's good. So back to your thing. We, you know, it was going well. We were declaring marine parks all over the show. You know, Lord Howe comes on steam, Cape Byron came on steam, Port Stephens even came on steam in 2005, Bateman's in 2006, ripping along, it was doing real well. And then there was a pause, very, very long pause. And, you know, the Hawkesbury Bioregional Assessment came out in 2005. This was what they said. There we go, Woo! knock yourself out, 1%. <laughs> of the area. Add in the, add in the Commonwealth down to point two. Any sort of protection at all, including land next to land parks, is still only 3%. And, you know, it's just a pathetic sort of level is where we're at. That's what the report said. And we thought, we were on the Marine Parts of Asia Council, we thought, Ripper, we're going to get this through, don't worry. Easy. <sighs> They did the grain earth shark aggregation areas. They found out where all these things lived. They were scared as hell when they actually worked out there weren't many left. But it was, again, it was a big reason. Looking at Sydney, we'd already got the intertidal protected areas, and they did upgrade some of those to aquatic reserves. Well, they actually only upgraded one of them, Judy and Nikki and, and Ricky. They actually only upgraded Cabbage Tree Bay. The rest of them, they left really as intertidal protected areas. They just gave them a new name. Looking at our beautiful bit of the coast, this is, what, this is where we are in the pavilion, and that's the area down there, down to Bronte. I have been there. <laughs> and this is the only bit of protection that we've got at Bondi, South Bondi. And that's the intertidal protected area. It's exactly where the coastal walk, the um, sculptures are at the moment. So if you do the sculptural walk, you are walking basically the intertidal protected area. It is almost impossible to access the rock platforms there, so it was an easy one for them to gazette because nobody could get to it. But there you go, I'm being cynical. Now when you actually get down to the aquatic reserve that's south of us, from Bronte down to Kuji, was gazetted as an aquatic reserve which is different to an IPA. And when that grope was shot, when I was leading a uh, snorkeling tour in Clavelli Pool, we managed to get Bob Carr to actually change the rules on this. And that was important. Changed the rules a little bit in this sort of area. But it's a mess. Look at it. Look at the rules in that. Jeez, you'd have to be confident to go and say, hey, mate, you can't do that. It's an absolute mess. And there's huge conflicts of interest. You've got hundreds of people in there snorkeling, swimming. You can legally chuck a line in with a great big hook on it. It's, it's a mad, mad social mess. And then, good old Kerry Street Bay. Much simpler. Nice and simple. Yes, you can do stuff here. No, you can't do stuff there. It empowers people. It's really important when we're pushing for these things in Sydney, I think it's got to be simple. Whatever you do, it's got to be simple. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And this is, this is what I reckon is the main thing for Sydney, reading all of that and reviewing it all. If we go for these passive recreation areas and we go for the Australian thing, as a POM coming over here, one of the things, you know, you know Got to have a fair go, mate, and all of those things. Excuse the lousy ac attempted accent. But, you know, having the fair go, I think, is the thing that we can use really the most. Getting in there, 
getting in and saying, look, there are lots of people who want to use, this is the last slide, um, there are lots of people who want to see an undisturbed marine environment. I think this is what we've got to counter. You've got to counter a social issue with another social issue. Yeah? You've actually, we've got to get together. It's brilliant, I hear, that Tricky's got a dive association going together. There needs to be a snorkel association. There needs to be a fish appreciation association. Whatever the hell it is, get together, get active, and actually get these things up and get some numbers up. Show those selection criteria that work. I think that is the way that things can happen in, in Sydney and the uh, Hawkesbury Shelf. That's just, I thought I'd try and give a bit of a background and I'm actually now re-energized into this process. You know, it didn't help when they... I, I did get a laugh, though, when the media release came out in 2011. New South Wales government takes the politics out of marine parks. It was a bit of black humour, but I, I did get a laugh out of it. However, just recently, the 16th of October, this New South Wales marine estate integrated coastal zone management. I haven't heard that term for years. That is really, really hopeful. And having the independent scientific group is really, really hopeful. And putting this, the, getting this legislative format up, the Marine Estate Management Bill, if that gets up, some stage or other, all of these little ducks are going to line up and it will be possible. So I think there's a real time of hope. It's been pretty bleak for the last few years, but I think there's a real time of hope coming. Thank you very much for listening.